Good afternoon and welcome to our final data camp session, Introduction to Machine Learning Using Python in Databricks. Let's just go through a couple of administrative announcements before we get started. Please remember to stay muted with your camera turned off to minimize distractions. Also, please use the Zoom chat to ask us any questions and submit your thoughts. At the end of the session, the questions will be answered by our session speaker. This session is going to be led by Deshane Joseph. I'm going to turn it over to him to give him give you guys a little bit more information about himself as well as our session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Julia. My name is Deshane, and I'm a, a senior machine learning engineer uh, slash data engineer at QDAS. And a little bit of background about myself. Um, I did uh, software development for many years, but the last seven or eight years, I've been focused on uh, data science and machine learning. Um, and uh, I can tell you it's been a very exciting journey. Next next slide, please. So today's uh, agenda is to discuss sort of the basic steps of machine learning using Python in, in the Databricks environment. Um, so we'll do an overview of machine learning, then an overview of data pre-processing, uh, which is a very important part of uh, machine learning then overview of the model training and validation uh, and discuss uh, the results um, of um, implementation of a, a sample healthcare related data set uh, so so that is the agenda for today and i know there are various levels of expertise in the audience so this is kind of targeted towards somebody who's um maybe interested in moving from doing ml from r to uh, python or maybe maybe somebody who is uh, you know uh, getting into machine learning using Python. So it's kind of an introductory uh, level approach. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start out with you know what is machine learning. Uh, it's a subfield of computer science where you know computers learn from data without being uh, explicitly programmed. So in the next slide, uh, there's a graphic which kind of explains that in more detail. So next slide, please. So we have a, a diagram here at the top. It depicts uh, the traditional computing model. Learning. ML is an umbrella term for solving problems for which development of algorithms by human programmers would be cost prohibitive. And instead the problems are solved by helping machines discover their own algorithms without needing to be explicitly told what to do by any human developed algorithms. This is from Wikipedia. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I think my Siri took over for a minute there. Um, so at the top, you find uh, a graphic which describes the traditional computing model. Um, and uh, where you have an input to the computer, and then you have an algorithm which you write in your favorite language, uh, and then out comes an output. So that is a traditional computing model. But in, in the machine learning model, we have an input and output, you know, going into the computer, and through a, what we call a training process, the output of that is an algorithm or a model. So, so the data is a key uh, in the machine learning model, and the output would be a model that we can use to predict um, what you know something based on new data. So next slide, please. So just to give a timeline on machine learning in a historical perspective, AI and machine learning has been around since the 50s and 60s and 70s. And it just really started flourishing in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s. But it really took off in the last two decades, uh, especially with the advent of so-called deep learning, which is another name for neural network-based machine learning. And one reason for this is the like two factors, the confluence of two factors, that is the availability of very high power compute and, and lots of lots of data. And those are the two things that are needed to, um, to, uh, uh, to develop all these exciting advances that you see recently, things like self-driving cars or language translation or the latest and greatest of, that everybody's talking about, the LLMs that's like chat GPT, et cetera. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of exciting things happening in machine learning right now. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the uh, you know types of machine learning. The two major types are supervised machine learning 
um, and also this unsupervised machine learning. So what we mean by supervised machine learning is that, uh, let's say the idea of machine learning is that you have a set of features uh, or variables uh, and that, that uh, produce some outcome, let's say the price of a house. And it can, it can vary based on you know, the square footage, the location, the city where you're in, all those, those, those are the features. And the outcome that, that we may want to predict is the, you know, the price of the house. So, so if we have a lot of historical data with that kind of information with the features and the outcome, like we, they're also called labels or the target variables. Then if we have that data available, then it's, we can build a supervised model. Um, and some of the examples of supervised machine learning are linear regression, logistic regression, um, decision trees, support vector machines, random forest. And uh, of course, I didn't add uh, deep neural networks. I mean, those are the the, the major machine learning uh, models that are really built today. And um, so those are some of the examples of supervised machine learning. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the types of unsupervised machine learning are clustering. K-means clustering is one of them. Let's say if you know, you know YouTube wants to segment the, the, the people who come to the site based on various characteristics, uh, you know, based on their demographic, their interest, uh, age, et cetera. So they don't have, you know, explicitly labeled data on that, but using some of the features, the characteristics of the user interactions they have with the videos, et cetera, they can segment them into different clusters by using an algorithm like K-means. So you don't need labels for those. Uh, another kind of unsupervised machine learning is principal component analysis. It is primarily used for reducing the dimensionality of a machine learning problem. Some, some of the problem may have hundreds of thousands of features. And if you have that many features, it becomes hard to train a model, very expensive computationally. And so the one PCA is one method that is very popular in reducing that dimensionality. And uh, there's something called auto encoders. So that's type of deep neural networks that are um, commonly used for uh, anomaly detection. So it has a specific architecture. Uh, it can also be used for uh, reducing dimensionality of a problem. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about data pre-processing. Uh, I think there's one slide before this, the previous one, please. Yeah, there you go. Sorry so, about that. <laughs> uh, no problem. So data pre-processing is the most important step uh, in machine learning. So data scientists and machine learning engineers spend about 60, 70 percent of the time pre-processing the data. The data quality and the data in the right format is very important to train an accurate model. So let's look at some of the uh, steps that are involved in data pre-processing. Things like, you know, in real world, you know, data is not clean, right? We all know that. There are missing values. Um, there are outliers, you know, which really doesn't add value to the uh, overall problem. Maybe, maybe there, there are because of mistakes and measurements or errors. So those needs to be eliminated. For uh, missing values, there are various techniques like imputation, um, and there are various types of imputation. And there, or can, if there are numbers of those missing values are small, maybe you can remove them from the from the data set. So those are all you know ways to handle uh, those kind of issues. And then there is a data transformation called one of them, which is normalization, which means like is scaling the data uh, from something let's say from zero to one. And what that does is let's say for some features vary from one to ten, the other varies from, you know, in the thousands. So that can have some variables with the high uh, ranges can have an outsized impact uh, on certain models. So it is beneficial to scale them to a, like a common scale. It's still, you know, maintaining all that variability in the distribution. So normalization is one way of doing that. And the standardization is another rescaling where in which you you scale the data so the mean um, is zero and the standard deviation is one. So these all these methods 
you know, uh, can contribute to developing a better model. Next slide, please. So, and then the, another um, important data pre-processing step is dealing with categorical data. By categorical data, what we mean is that, you know, the only thing that, that a machine learning model can understand is numbers. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the data set we have, you know, a lot of the data sets have columns which are, you know, string types, like text data, like the gender of, of you know, of the, of the population, or, you know, where, where they work, or uh, male or female, you know, th those kind of different textual data needs, uh, needs to be converted into numbers. And there are different ways of handling that. One hot encoding is one way of doing that. Uh, and label encoding is another type of assigning unique integers to each category. Um, so those that's an important step that we have to do. Uh, and, and the next one is sometimes you might have to create new features. So, and why would we want to do that? Uh, again, the ultimate goal is to produce a model that that will you know generalize to the data that, that is, it has not seen and also try to you know pick up the underlying features of the, the data set so things like binning which means that you put like a continuous variable and then put that in a different buckets and something called polynomial features in which you you take a feature called x and then you actually square that or maybe um, cube that in order to capture some of the nonlinear effects of some of those variables. Then there are called, something called interaction variables you can create. There's a feature called X and Y. You multiply X and Y, then create a new feature. And that can maybe model some of the interaction between two of the features. So, so those are some of the different um, you know, uh, features regarding processing step for creating new features. Then this dimensionality reduction, like we talked about, uh, applying PCA uh, and something called TSNE. So those are all good for visualizing and also improving model performance. Uh, then for things like image data and text data, data augmentations can be an important step because sometimes there's only uh, limited images that you have available for, let's say, do an image classification task. So how do we increase that data set? The more data that we have, the, the more generalizable model that we can build. So, uh, so we can generate more artificial data by let's say rotating the images or cropping the data. And for text data, you can create, um, uh, we can substitute words with the synonyms. So that's how we can create extra data to build a better model. Uh, so in short, you know, data pre-processing is a very important step uh, in, in ensuring that we have, uh, you know, we can build a good model. Next slide, please. So next we talk about model training. Uh, the first step in that is that we divide the data set into training, validation, and testing. So we set up the, usually they, we set up 70 or 80% of the data for training and maybe 5% for validation which is actually used for in the training phase of the machine learning process. And then after the training is done, you, uh, you will use the model that we built on the test data that it is not seen, and that's how we evaluate the model. So like I said, the common split ratio is 80%, 80, 20, could be 70, 30%, uh, depending on the data set. So, you know, so that's the first step in model training. Next slide, please. So uh, evaluation metrics. So what do we mean by that? So once we build the model, we need to evaluate the models. So we need to use, we can use various metrics for that, depending on what kind of problem that we are solving. Uh, if it's a classification problem, like then we use, uh, we can use something like accuracy, precision and recall or F1 score, which is kind of a combination of precision and recall. Uh, uh, or if it is a regression problem, we're trying to predict a continuous value. You see something called MSC, is mean squared error, or R, R, R MSC, which is the root of MSC. So those are popular, you know, evaluation metrics. Um, so uh, we will use the the build, the model that we build on the test data and evaluate using these metrics, and we decide whether this model is you know, satisfactory for release into production or, you know, um, 
uh, go to the next step. And if, if you're not uh, happy with your model, what do we do? So there are two things we can do. So we can go back and um, one of the first things we want to try is what we call hyperparameter tuning. What we mean by that is that every model, whether it's a classical model like you know logistic regression or random forest or a deep neural network based models, there are a lot of parameters that you can tweak and tune to try to improve the performance. For example, if it, if it is a neural network model, you know, there's some, you know, there, you build this layers of, uh, of multiple layers. You have an input layer, there are, you know, there are hidden layers, then you have an output, output layer. And then each of these layers, there are a number of neurons. Uh, so these are all decisions that we can make and change in order to, you know, in order to try to build a better model. So that's, that's what is called hyperparameter tuning. And there are uh, different, you know, methods uh, and libraries out there which to help you with the uh, with just that uh, things like grid search is very popular random search and Bayesian optimization these are all some of the popular uh, hyperparameter hyper tuning methods uh, that are used in the industry uh, next i think we are almost done with the slides i think is that right yeah so now i'll move on to the the slide uh, to the notebook the databricks notebook where we implement one of the data sets that we mentioned. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hey, Julia, am I able to do that now? Or? Yep, you can go ahead. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, can you, are you able to see my screen? Yep, we can see it now. Thank you. All right, thank you. So what you're looking at is it's a Databricks, it's a Jupyter notebook hosted on uh, the, our Databricks uh, environment. And it's uh, attached right now to a, P, a QDAS compute uh, cluster. Um, so I know uh, Derek went over a lot of the details of Python programming you know, uh, on Databricks. So I'm going to just focus on the ML aspects, right? So we start off with importing the necessary packages, uh, like uh, he mentioned also. Uh, NumPy and Pandas are very important for machine learning, pre-processing, data analysis, etc. So that's what we're doing here. And in the next cell, um, I'm importing a bunch of libraries from sklearn. And this one library that you, you cannot do without is sklearn. It's called scikit-learn. It's a Python library for machine learning. So it has all kinds of classes and methods for uh, model building, pre-processing, evaluation metrics, post-processing, anything you can think of related to machine learning that you can find in, in scikit-learn. So if you, anybody wants to do Python machine learning, this is a library to get hold of and understand, uh, you know, and start with. Then we also import Matplotlib and Seaborn for visualization purposes so that's all that are, that's also an important part of the the data analysis so the data set that i'm going to be working with is one from kaggle it's a stroke prediction data set uh, as you all know kaggle has lots of data set that people post and then uh, uh, and post studies about that uh, analysis about those which is a great uh, place to learn data science and machine learning uh, in the next cell, so what I'm doing is uh, re using Spark to read. So first I uploaded that data to an S3 bucket location, uh, and I'm loading that into a Spark data frame first, because a Spark data frame supports uh, that kind of a functionality. Uh, then since for data analysis and data pre-processing, you know, the Pandas data frame is a better choice for me. Uh, and I'm dealing with, you know, fairly, it's a small data set. So I don't need, you know, the huge, the distributed um, capabilities of the Spark data frame yet. So I'm converting that into a regular Pandas data, data frame here. So, and I just print the columns of, of that data frame. Uh, and as you can see, some of the columns are ID, gender, age, hypertension, heart disease, whether they've been married or not, work type, residence type. 
glucose levels, BMI, smoking status, and stroke. And stroke, that is the target variable. So that's what we are trying to predict. So all the others are the input features. Oh, so in the next cell, we use this head uh, method from a pandas data frame, which lists uh, you know, the top, uh, let's say X number of records. The default is five. You can specify whatever number you like as an argument. So just to get a take a look at you know, the data, what it looks like, you know, this is part of that uh, data exploration that we do. So if you look at that, you know, you know, the gender is of course categorical variable. Um, hypertension zero means you know they don't have hypertension. One means they do. The same with heart disease. And if you look at BMI, so you have you know, so you know that you know that's a numerical you know value, right? But some of them have NA value because that that value is not available for that particular person. So that's a problem, right? So we can't have the machine learning models only can accept no numbers. We need to convert that somehow to a number, right? So, so Pandas has a handy method called two numeric. So we take that column, BMI column, and convert that into a numeric column. Uh, so what happens is that um, it it create when you do, when you convert you know like a string to a numeric. I mean, it doesn't know what value to put, right? So it puts null, null value, so the NAN in the Python type. Um, so that's what it does in that cell there. And then in the next cell, I run this method called East NA, which is a pandas method for counting the number of null records in a data frame and for each of these uh, various columns. So if you look at BMI, it has 201 null records, which is a result of this the conversion that uh, we did earlier. Um, so, of course, we cannot have null values. You know, we have to do something with, you know, with that. So, um, the one thing we can do is imputation, as we talked about earlier. So, the fill NA method uh, of the panel data frame uh, can be used to, to impute null values. So, in this case, I've used the mode uh, the most frequent uh, value of the BMI across the data set uh, as uh, the imputation value here. So once I do that, do that East NA um, method again and uh, see how many nulls, null record, you know, how many records have nulls. So as you can see that the BMI doesn't have any more null records. So we have taken care of that problem. Um, <clears throat> then to illustrate some of the useful methods that pandas has you know value counts so it'll list the frequency of some of these values how many uh, people have you know value of 28.4 you know so these can kind of uh, analysis can be useful to get an idea about the data distribution etc um in the next cell we have a I use the describe method to um kind of get, get a basic statistics of uh, of the data, things like, I know Derek talked about it also, uh, the count, mean, and standard deviation, and min and max, et cetera. In the next cell, to the ID column doesn't add any value, just a database primary key, um, right? So we don't, that doesn't add any value to our study. So we drop, use the drop method to drop, you know, that, that column. And you will notice this, this flag called in place is equal to true. In, it'll be very common in a lot of the uh, data frame methods. If you use that, you can, you know, you, you don't have to replace this variable. Otherwise, you'll have to return this to another data frame variable to get that change affected. So if you use in place, it makes that change in this data, data frame variable itself. So that's one thing to, uh, it's good to know that. So in the next step, we're kind of dividing the features into categorical features using you know the d types method um, and numerical features sort of for convenience and kind of visualization purposes as you will see in the in the uh, next few cells so then we from the numerical features we we'll remove the stroke as i mentioned this is a target variable so we want to remove that from the the features right so that's what we're doing there and if you print out the numerical features, uh, age, hypertension, heart disease, 
the glucose level and BMI, those are the numerical features. And the categorical features are the gender, married, work type, residence type, and smoking status. Um, so in the next cell, you can use the unique function of the data frame, the panel data frame to list the, what are the unique values in each column. So, you know, it prints, you know, the, the unique, you know, female, other, um, male and other, and then we have, you know, a yes and no for the ever married and self-employed, private, different categories like that. So you can detect all the unique values in a particular column using the unique method. And next come uh, kind of an important uh, plot that uh, tells us something about the data set. So we are plotting the target variable, the stroke. What is the distribution of that variable in the data set? So as we can see that 95% did not have stroke in that in this data set, 5% had. So this is what is called a highly imbalanced data sets. And highly imbalanced data sets are a problem that we have to deal with in machine learning. It has to be addressed in some way or the other. So there are different techniques for that. So what is the reason why we had to handle that? If we don't handle it, then if you develop a model uh, with a highly imbalanced data set, then the model doesn't have an opportunity to, to learn the features of the minority data set. So that when, it's, when we are done with the modeling and we pass it some new data set, so it doesn't have enough you know, knowledge, it doesn't have, it hasn't captured uh, all the features for this minority data set. So the model may not be very accurate. So there are a couple of different ways of uh, handling that, that problem. The one is oversampling you know, um, the, the minority data set. I can, um, there is a method called SMOT. It's a synth it creates synthetic data based on the minority sample, with the similar distribution characteristics, so which is what we'll be using later on in, the, in, the, uh, in this analysis. And you can undersample the minor the majority said that's another approach. So, you know, so, but this has to be uh, addressed in our data pre-processing step. In the next cell, we're building like a method to do some visualizations, just to get a feel for how these variables stack up uh, against, you know, against each other. So as you can see that in the gender distribution, they're more female uh, than male in this population. Uh, they're more married than not. Uh, and then more people work in the private sector. Um, not sure if that has any impact on uh, stroke prediction. Uh, urban versus rural, almost even. Um, never smoked is higher than other categories. So you get a, get a feel for the, you know, the distribution. The same thing we do with uh, numerical uh, features. Uh, we are plotting the age, you know, in the form of histograms. Uh, the age is ranging from zero to 80 or 90. Uh, and it gives a count of uh, how many people belong to those, those buckets. And here we plot, you know, more, you know, how many people have hypertension versus not. The same with heart disease and uh, glucose level and BMI. Uh, here we do some uh, bivariate analysis. How do these features stack up against the target variables? Uh, like how many male versus female had a stroke? You know, that kind of analysis. So this kind of visual analysis is very important as part of uh, any kind of pre-processing. So now we are almost getting ready to um, do the training part of the analysis. So first thing we do is we, from the data frame, we drop that stroke uh, column. So that will give us all the input features, which we call X. And if we just take only the stroke column, uh, we are uh, just uh, isolating that. And that is our Y, which is our label, our label because this is a supervised machine learning problem. So we got our X input features and our target labels. Uh, then we use this scale learn method called test train split to um, split the data, like we mentioned, do whatever proportion that you choose. choose. In this case, we, uh, you chose like a 70, 30% uh, proportion for test versus training. So we get our X, X, X train, Y train, uh, which is what we're going to use for training and X test and Y test for the uh, testing part of it. In the next uh, slide, we are uh, installing a library, a SMOT 
uh, oversampling library that I was mentioning um, earlier, and we can use either ampersand or, or the you know the pound sign. But if you use ampersand, that that kind of restart the Python interpreter. So you know so that's why I didn't use that in this case. Um, so the, we're just installing that packet in that cell. In the next cell, we're importing some more libraries, helper classes that that can be used that can make the model building process more uh, a little bit more clean and intuitive uh things like uh, pipeline pipeline classes can be used to reduce some of the boilerplate code that happens you know in a lot of the machine learning code uh, so basically you can assemble a, a, a collection of steps and apply them sequentially and execute them one at a, at a time so that's what that pipe, pipeline class does and column transformer we'll see later on what that does a uh, simple imputer is uh, again one imputer imputing class uh, that, uh, we could use uh, smote is the uh, oversampling method that we're using to address the the imbalanced data set so uh, using this pipeline we could create two pipelines uh, uh, one is a numerical pipeline so for which the use a simple imputer with a strategy of median uh, you know, and in this case, as we looked earlier, we don't have, we kind of resolved all the null issues, really, right? So this is just for illustration purposes. But you know, you could use the simple imputer with the different strategies, me, median or mode, or uh, uh, those kind of uh, different approaches. Then the, using for scaling the data, using a sc standard scalar, another sklearn library, and for categories, categorical variables. We're using the simple imputer with the most frequent uh, approach, and we're using the one hard encoder for the labeling or encoding the categorical um, features. So that that's going to be impl implemented because we have several, you know, categorical features. So we're going to be using that one hard encoding for encoding those variables into numerical data. Uh, <clears throat> And then we create column transformer. Uh, so it's another helper class for separating the numer uh, numerical and categorical uh, features uh, and applying them uh, separately. Uh, and we create this mode uh, uh, class, you know, instantiate that in order to include that as part of our pipeline. The next step is we, we choose the model that, that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to use the logistic regression because this is a classification problem. It's like a binary classification problem, right? We're trying to predict when somebody has or might have a stroke or not. The so logistic regression is a widely used model for that. So we instantiate that class. Um, and then we put all this together in the pipeline class. So we start with the preprocessor, then we apply the, the oversampling, and then we apply the, the model. So once we put the pipeline together, then we call the fit method and pass the X train and the Y train, our training data set. And this does the training process. And in this case, it is a very small data set. It doesn't take much time at all. But this is sometimes, you know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, huge models, for example, GPT-4, I read that it took weeks and months to train that model. It had like 175 billion parameters. So it, it took that weeks and months. Some models can take that long to train using all kinds of distributed uh, computing uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, but uh, ours is a very tiny model, so it took only a few, few seconds. So once we uh, once we do the training, we have the model that we can test. So then the next step use the predict method of the pipeline to and the and passing the X test, the twenty percent or thirty percent that we set aside for testing and pass that to the predict method. Um, so that is our predictions. So these are predictions, you know, as, as to, you know, which of these people will have stroke or not. So this is the data that the model has not seen yet. And the next step is something called the score. It's another method from sklearn. So AUC score is kind of an evaluation metric, uh, which is called area under the curve, uh, which is used in classification problems, which kind of gives both a weightage for precision and recall, um, and it's considered a good metric for evaluating classification problems. And it prints out a value of 0.76. 
So that, that's considered a good model. So anything, like a random model is 0.5, you know, so like a coin flip. Uh, but so the higher, the closer the, mo- the values to one, the better the model is. So this kind of says that there's 76% chance that this model predicts uh, the correct uh, class for that particular person. So, you know, so but this is a pretty clean data set, small data set. So even with the minor pre-processing, we're able to get a pretty good model. And another popular evaluation matrix called confusion matrix, in which we can print uh, the, the true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and in a nice graphic. So we use the confusion matrix display method or class from the sklearn. So that's what we are doing here. So uh, essentially, we have, you know, your train is done, gone through the entire process. Then uh, I just wanted to also try a different model. Uh, you know, so we use logistic regression. Then we created something called the support vector classifier (SVC). It's another classifier. So I instantiated that class and created another pipeline, second pipeline. The only thing that changes is the the model, and did, went through the same steps, fit the model or train the model using the training data. And then once the model is trained, do the predict, get the prediction values, feed that into the test actual versus uh, the predicted value and get the AUC curve. So we got 0.766, so slightly better than the previous model. So in the in a normal ML process, we will try different models um, and see you know, what which one does better. And sometimes we, we may use a mix of model or average of model, which is called the ensembling method. Um, you know, so that's sometimes used. So like I said, the modeling process is not strictly, you know, uh, uh, like you do, do one thing and then just, you're done. You're, you have to experiment. Sometimes you, have, sometimes you have to go back to hyperparameter tuning. Sometimes you may have to go back to your pre-processing. It takes a lot of iterative steps in order to achieve a model that is satisfactory. So that kind of concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Deshane, do you want to continue screen sharing in case you wanted to show anything on your end? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Derek did touch base on some of these, but just in case others have the same question or you wanted to add anything, on the first, are there challenges or opportunities when dealing with rare out- rare events or outcomes? Do you have recommendations for different evaluation metrics like F1 scores, Jacquard, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a rare event. That's a, you know, that yeah, imbalance problem that we are talking about, right? So I think we need to address that with either undersampling, you know, like oversampling in uh, under, you know, the minority data set or the data sample or, uh, you know, undersampling. Uh, uh, and there may be other methods also. Yeah, definitely rare event. And of course, that can be also framed as an anomaly detection problem. That's another way of looking at it, right? Because anomalies are also rare. And there are things like there are various uh, modeling techniques for detecting anomalies. Uh, one of them that I mentioned is autoencoders, where we train um, like deep neural network where on normal data. And then you come up with what they call reconstruction error based on normal data. Basically, what an autoencoder does is it takes an input and predicts the same input. Uh, it reduces the dimensionality, and then it brings it back to the same dimension. In the process, it kind of gets the sense of that uh, normal data, and then it reconstructs the same input data. And then you compute the re- difference between the actual input and the predicted input, which gives what they call the reconstruction error. So that is a measure of... Um, uh, you know, whether we can detect you know, nor- abnormal or rare event kind of a, a behavior. So then we pass, uh, apply that autoencoder model to a new data. If the reconstruction error is much higher, then that's an indication that there's something anomalous or uh, out of the ordinary is happening. So that's one approach that we can use. Thanks. Will open AI API be accessible to us? So that would be a question to you know the CMS leadership. Um, I, in fact, uh, before this for this demo, we, uh, one thing we kind of, um, we thought about doing was using an LLM, uh, you know, like a use case for LLM, maybe creating SQL using natural language. 
Uh, and we uh, debated that. And at that point, at least the, the direction I got that was we are not quite ready to use, you know, but uh, Alicia or Ken or, or anybody, uh, CMS folks can clarify that. And then we considered something, the um, open source one from Facebook Meta, it's called Llama. Uh, so, you know, uh, so yeah, so as far as uh, open, AI, uh, open AI API, uh, I will defer that to, you know, CMS folks to say. Thanks. Do you use um, XGBoost library for these models? Yeah, we, we could. Yeah, XGBoost is a very popular model for classification and regression. You know, yeah, it definitely can be used. Yeah. But as SS, uh, just like you know, the random forest decision trees and a whole host of, if you take a look at Scalearn, it has like, you know, you know, several, several models that can be used for classification or regression type problems. Okay, at this point, I'm going to go back to sharing. We have a quick wrap up. We're going to circle back to that. But in the meantime, thank you so much to Shane for presenting today and answering your questions. We are going to go to a survey now for our data camp wrap up. So yeah. Yeah. Ken was able to join. He's here now. Okay, just kidding. We're gonna we're gonna switch up our order here a little bit. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Ken Howard for some closing remarks. Timing is everything. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for attending. We we you know they're gonna do a survey. I really look forward to getting your feedback, both in survey and any other method, Slack if you use it, uh, uh, email if you need it uh, to to communicate what is and is not valuable to you in these. We like to tailor these for a uh, high priority uh, interactions, very detail oriented approaches to things, and to get more roadmaps to keep your awareness of where we're going, both technologically, you know, policy wise, uh, and governance wise with the uh, analytic environment. So please participate with that. I look forward to uh, uh, seeing what you're doing uh, for for CCSQ and the usage of our our platforms. If there's any any concerns or questions, again, don't hesitate to reach out. And and lastly, thank you again. Thanks so much, Ken. Okay, so now shifting to our survey. This is a survey that helps us know how we can improve our data camp for the future. Oh, <laughs> in a moment, a Zoom poll will pop up on your screen. You'll have about four minutes to answer these questions. Please make sure to scroll all the way down to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, complete the questions relevant to you and then hit submit to lock in your answers. After the four minutes has ended, the poll will be closed and the results will be used to improve our data cam content next time around. Thank you so much. This will be coming up on your screen in just a moment. We're about a minute and a half in. Just a reminder to please scroll all the way to the end to make sure we're not missing any questions. We'll have about two and a half minutes left, but do feel free if you wrap up the survey to drop. And thank you so much for participating.
Okay, we have about a minute left in our poll. Take another 15 seconds to wrap up, please. Thank you so much for participating and thank you so much for helping to make this such a successful data camp.